Hi, everybody. Welcome to the webinar from Community Alliance for Global Justice. Today is August 11th, 2022. And our webinar is Farming for a Hot Planet, Grassroots Alternative to Corporate Climate Smart Agriculture. We are joined by our pal panelists, Leonida Odongo and Dr. Jennifer Taylor, and our awesome crew of co-organizers from summer school who are hosting this event, as well as our AgriWatch consultant, Ashley. Thank you again for joining us. I'm gonna kick it off to Molly, who will do a land acknowledgement to open our session. Molly, feel free to take it away. Thank you, Deb. Okay, thank you everyone who is here for this awesome webinar that's going to happen today. Um, as, as Dev said, as always, we start with a land acknowledgement. Firstly, I'm going to post a link in the chat um, and ask and encourage those of us who are on occupied and colonized indigenous land to use this tool and discover and reference whose ancestral land they are on. Uh, we acknowledge that CAGJ operates on and does much of its work on Duwamish, Coast Salish, Suquamish, Sligwamish, and Muckleshoot land, among others. We honor these peoples who have been here, are here, and will be here stewarding the land and bringing life into the earth, living and honoring their heritage. May we all be inspired to learn more about the history of the land we were on and about the peoples who have traditional claim to it and to connect with modern movements, calls for land back and calls for support by indigenous peoples who hold ancient knowledge and connection to the land. P please feel free to contribute to the chat what land you are on and any resources you would like to share. Um, I am posting in the chat a link to Real Rent Duwamish and encourage those of us on Duwamish land to contribute in support and recognition that we, were, we are on unceded territory. One second. There we are. And then I would like to ask all of you to go through a grounding exercise with me as part of this as well. It may help for visualization if you feel comfortable closing your eyes. So to begin, think to the ground beneath you, wherever that may be. Think about the layer under what we can see with our eyes, the various nutrients in the dirt, enriching it and glimmering with energy, the bugs and ecosystem, and the whole dark, rich world underneath. Coming up to the surface, I'll ask you to imagine a plant you might find in that soil. It could be a native plant, something you planted or are growing currently, or your favorite berry, flower, or vegetable. Think about the stalk extending from the ground, ground, growing into the leaves and structure of the plant, reaching towards the sun, or maybe trailing along the ground. As we take, as you imagine like a breath in, the energy from the soil extending into the upper portions of the plant, filling it to the tips of its leaves. And like a breath out, the energy filing back down into the roots, grounding itself and resonating in the rich soil. Let us be in awe of and honor the land that gives life to everything we know and recognize our connection and responsibility towards it, the ancient breathing earth that we are honored to be living upon. And with that, respect the ancient connections that have been continuously honored by native people. And that is, thank you for going through that with me. And thank you again for everyone for being here. And it is my honor to pass things on now to Ashley um, for contextualization and kicking off the webinar. Thank you, Molly. Um, so I wanted to just provide a little bit of context for the corporate climate smart agriculture piece. Um, so we'll hear from the panelists later about kind of grassroots alternatives, um, but I wanted to provide kind of the, the overall political context that we're responding to here. So as you all probably know, corporations have increasingly captured the global food system. Just to give a couple of examples, if you go to most grocery stores in the US or in Europe, you're probably confronted by the vast majority of products that are produced by companies owned by 10 massive corporations like Kraft, Kellogg, General Mills. Globally, seed sales are, are dominated by four 
huge agrochemical companies, corporations. So food and agriculture corporations have come to have enormous monopolistic power and control over what we eat, what we grow, what's, pro what's produced for us. And they've accordingly expanded their influence in policy circles at national and international levels. And they've been aided in doing that, gaining that influence and gaining market share by philanthropic foundations, including the Gates Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation. In particular, the Gates Foundation, which is one of the wealthiest foundations in the world, has amassed a huge amount of uh, power over international decision-making around agriculture, promoting industrial farming, biotechnology, um, tech-led and tech-driven solution, quote-unquote solutions to global hunger, um, and the increased role of the private sector, including many corporations. Powerful institutions and individuals are now gaining even more control through what's termed climate smart agriculture. And on the surface, this seems like a really positive and important thing, because we know that industrial agriculture is a major driver of climate and ecological change. Industrial agriculture contributes over a third of um, human induced or human caused greenhouse gas emissions, and it's the single largest driver of biodiversity loss worldwide. So a climate sensitive approach is urgently needed, but so-called climate smart agriculture is actually a form of greenwashing. The term climate smart agriculture, which I'll refer to as CSA, it was created in 2009 by the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization. And CSA is explicitly focused on tapping into the emergent climate finance industry um, including carbon markets that have been established by the Kyoto Protocol's clean development mechanism. And it aims to use public and private finance to invest in novel approaches to agriculture. This includes climate resilient crop varieties that are often created through biotechnology, as well as a range of interventions that fall into the category of digital or precision agriculture which uses artificial intelligence, drones, robotics, and other technologies to do things like tell farmers the pH of their soil, um, indicate how much fertilizer, chemical fertilizer they should apply or the exact amount of water they need for irrigation. And keep in mind that there are already a huge number of climate resilient crops that already exist, that have been developed by farmers and maintained and produced by farmers. Um, there's already sustainable water management practices, and there are already methods of testing soil pH using test strips or things like that, which are already in use and could be very easily scaled up with minimal investment. So if you look at the many initiatives that fall under the umbrella of CSA, they're backed by corporations like Microsoft, Bayer, which owns Monsanto, and Pepsi, as well as industry-backed trade associations like Crop Life International. They're also financed by the World Bank, by wealthy governments and by billionaires, including institutions like Jeff Bezos' Earth Fund and the Gates Foundation. And the CSA model has become dominant in international governance forums as the main way of addressing climate change in agriculture. So at the 2021 COP26 Global Climate Negotiations, US Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack, announced the Aim for Climate initiative, which is based on climate smart agriculture, and works to increase investments in quote unquote innovative science-based solutions to climate change. Um, Aim for Climate is funded by the Gates Foundation and it's spearheaded by the US and the United Arab Emirates, which are two of the world's largest contributors to human caused climate change through the extraction and combustion of fossil fuels. So it's very clear that CSA is fundamentally about creating more opportunities for the wealthy to make even more money developing and selling new products while claiming to be helping farmers and addressing climate change. And we should also be clear that the problem isn't just like that these, these initiatives are relying on financial mechanisms. There's a lot of other problems, like they don't work. So digital agriculture, for example, um, disregards the hidden climate costs of constructing and maintaining large data centers that are required for many of the initiatives to work. And carbon markets, which are another tool of CSA, can actually increase emissions from the largest polluters. Second, these initiatives also raise new kinds of concerns and problems around ownership, sharing, and privacy around data, seeds, and knowledge. And third, they redirect money and priorities toward expensive, speculative technologies rather than spending more on accessible, 
agroecological practices that are already in use where this money could go much, much further and have much more impact. So we'd like to focus the rest of the discussion today on these grassroots and farmer-led agroecological solutions to climate change, which are being marginalized in these mainstream discussions around CSA. And we believe that agroecological solutions led by farmers serving food sovereignty should be instead upheld and promoted. What would it look like for agroecological initiatives to be at the forefront of these discussions about how to build climate resilient futures? What would that mean for farmers, consumers, for politics, and for the planet? So with that, I will now turn it over to our two presenters today to introduce themselves, their organizations, and the work that they've been doing. So could we start please with um, Dr. Jennifer Taylor? Dr. Jennifer, if you, you have come on the scene, you're muted. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Great, thank you. Uh, it is such a wonderful honor to be here and participate in this webinar today. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And uh, to meet a new friend and colleague on the panel, thank you so much for the opportunity too. Um, do you have my PowerPoint? Okay, thank you so much. Um, as mentioned earlier, I'm Jennifer Taylor and I am an agroecology small farmer in the state of Georgia. And um, could you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, this is our farmland in Georgia. My grandmother actually farmed this land before me and uh, she started out early in her life as a sharecropper on another piece of land. And she was given an opportunity to buy her own farmland. Um, can, you, can you go to the next slide, please? Today, we are the only certified organic farm in our county and in our surrounding counties. We use some of the same tools that my grandmother used and we grow many of the same crops that my grandmother also grew. We are agroecology organic small farmers. Our farming practices include pathways that promote well being, that promote healthy soils and healthy plants, healthy environments, and healthy communities to build resiliencies. We select varieties that can tolerate stress and that grow well in our sandy loam soils and under our extreme conditions. Our agroecology farm practices include crop rotations and mulches and earthworm compost and rain fed agricultural strategies, supporting pollinator habitats and seed saving and uplifting indigenous knowledge, establishing farmer to farmer networks and sharing information, knowledge and practices through on-farm hands-on trainings and learning workshops and farm tours. So we are able to share information with underserved farming populations, resource poor farming populations to add to their knowledge base, agroecology farm practices. Um, and the benefits of these strategies on their farm and communities. Uh, so you see us here with the cover crops um, uh, on, on the top slides and um, pine straw using as mulch and also enhancing um, uh, moisture content and uh, acting in many of the same ways that in the benefits of cover crops. We use both of those methods on our farm. Could you go to the next slide, please? And here are some of our beautiful um, agroecology certified organic uh, produce that we grow and produce at the farm. You see muscadine and ginger and turmeric and um, strawberries, organic certified produce from the farm. At, uh, can you go to the next slide, please? At Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University, I am a social professor and I actually created our statewide small farm program. It is a sustainable development participatory capacity building program that works holistic in nature. Um, the program works with socially disadvantaged, 
resource poor, limited resource, underserved small farm populations and their communities and farm workers and their communities to identify needs and work together. Uh, uh, critical focus is agroecology and agroecology organic farming systems and their benefits that promote resilience and add protection and restoration to farmers and farm environments and communities. And you know, it helps to conserve water and soil and the sustainable uses of these practices that give benefits to farmers and, and um, their environments. So we're always working to build and equip resource poor underserved farmers to recover in climate change or in climate dis disruption and maintain and even increase the yields for their families and communities. All of these work together to build sustainability and thrivability and resiliences within the farmers and the farm, uh, farmland and also in the farming community. Um, so as a result of these hands-on capacity building sessions that we have, they're intensive one to two day learning sessions on farmers farms. We see changes in how farmers choose to grow their food and changes in how farmers choose to transition now to agroecology and organic farming systems and sometimes even certified um, uh, organic as well. The next slide, please. So um, as we're working with farmers, we're also building alternative market opportunities that uh, focus on agroecology farm practices and those benefits, organic farming systems practices, um, and those benefits to the farming community and to the, and to the community at large. Um, these are pathways that we call that, that encourage change, you know, change on the farms and change in the community as well. Can you go to the next slide, please? We work with communities as network partners to develop community gardens and youth and adult learning experiences on growing healthy foods and to help meet the needs of healthy food choices within underserved communities. So we're working with the adults and with the youth and we're always promoting agroecology um, as the basis of the learning and as the basis of the skill set within uh, agriculture. Can you go to the next slide, please? This is just an example of, I felt like an integrative opportunity to come to this event, you know, Terra Madre, um, as, a, an, um, as an organic farmer and agroecological um, farmer practicing uh, uh, and promoting the benefits of that uh, food system to build healthy, not only food systems, but food sovereignty, healthy food sovereignty systems, and to grow healthy environments uh, that impact local and, and national uh, communities. Next slide, please. I serve as a NOFO North America convener. And in June of last year, we actually participated in the NOFO North America um, with a NOFO North America and a NOFO headquarters as part of the 2021 United Nations Food System Summit Dialogues. Um, that particular session brought together the voices of underserved farmers, socially disadvantaged farmers, and their community organizations from across the nation. These small scale underserved farming populations and their voices were not included at the table when decisions were being made. The Enofo North America session gave an opportunity for us as agroecology farmers to share the, our benefits and visions and well being and policy recommendations and pathways toward building a better future today and tomorrow. That, this was an actually great opportunity because, um, uh, though it was a, a great uh, uh, problem on one level, for us still it proposed an opportunity to be added to the international dialogue concept of the United Nations in the 2021 United Nations Food Systems Summit. Can you go to the next slide, please? So this, I know you can't read anything. This is a new project uh, with USDA AMS that uh, where uh, we are working in conjunction with Maryland Eastern Shore, another 1890 land grant institution. I'm representing Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University. And we're working to support historically underserved farmers and ranchers and fishers and agribusinesses by assessing their challenges and creating together support. What is that support mechanism within communities that communities need? 
within their communities, communities serving as co-leaders in the project and helping to identify the needs and the hindrances and, and where they wanna go with this kind of project. Um, and the project will co-develop with socially disadvantaged farmers and their organizations deliberate actions to rectify inequalities in program access. And I actually feel that this is a great opportunity to enable relevant change for underserved communities and other resources that promotes co-leader participation, agroecology networks and agroecology farmers and community organizations and agroecology farm practices and their benefits to enable well-being and thriving uh, thrivability within our communities. Can you go to the next slide, please? This is our new center at Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University. It is the Lola Hampton Frank Pinder uh, Center for Agroecology. And yes, that is my grandmother, Lola Hampton, sitting right there with her second grade education in the name of the center. Um, a couple of months ago in June, the university approved our proposal to develop and implement an agroecology center at Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University. This is actually the first center of its kind focused on agroecology within 1890 land grant institutions, and it will work to promote um, agroecology with socially disadvantaged farmers and to promote uh, the benefits of these strategies. Uh, it will also work to implement an academic degree program for students at the university in agroecology. So we're so excited about this new opportunity. It's also already received funding and more funding um, uh, in line to, that we should receive this end of this month. And so we're really excited for this opportunity to introduce this particular agroecology center uh, that's focusing on agroecology farm strategies and those benefits for underserved farming populations and their communities. In closing, can you go to the next slide, please? These are the pathways that demonstrate how we work within our communities and networks, university systems and government systems and service on board memberships to promote agroecology, to engage, empower, equip and build resilient agroecology organic farmers and advocate for agroecology farmers, for resource poor farmers, and agroecology organic farming systems to enable change in our local and national communities and change in our global communities. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share a glimpse in our work in the last five years. Okay, thank you so much for that intro. Um, can we go ahead and turn it over to Leonida to introduce herself and her work? Uh, good evening from my part of the world. I hope I'm uh, audible enough. Uh, my name is Leonida Odongo. I work uh, for an organization called Haki Nawiri Africa, which is also a member of the Alliance for food sovereignty in Africa. So basically uh, our work around uh, agroecology looks at the twin crisis that we're having currently in the, in the world, but also in the African continent, uh, the food crisis, as well as the climate crisis. If you link these, if you look at uh, the IPCC report and also look at the latest uh, world food report, it actually, uh, uh, sounds an alarm, especially for the African continent, uh, given that uh, one, we are unable to cushion ourselves from the negative impacts. Uh, uh, we, we don't have systems, for example, subsidies, our governments never give us any form of subsidies. So it's survival for, for the fittest. Uh, uh, what I'll do is I'll just give you an overview of what's happening within the African continent. And then in the second part, I'm going to be sharing the on the ground intervention. So I'd like to request uh, if you could just put up the first slide, please. So if you look at uh, the uh, African uh, continent, one, uh, one thing I want to point out is that Africa is the, the newest frontier as far as markets for uh, uh, agrochemical companies are concerned, but also this is linked to the arable land and good climate as far as food production is concerned. And that's why we are, uh, a ready market for so many things. And you also find that our legislations uh, often tend to be weak and our governments always are always getting swayed 
For example, you find that uh, some chemicals have been banned, for instance, in Europe, but they're still finding their way in, in Africa and they're still being used uh, by farmers who many a times do not even have uh, protective gear. Uh, the writings are in languages that farmers do not understand. And of course, you're also having a problem of uh, the push for biotech, especially within the continent. And this is being said that uh, it's going to address uh, food insecurity. And sadly, if you look at uh, still within the continent, some of the issues that we have, one is uh, rising cases of hunger. Uh, and if you look at the IPCC report and the World Food Report, it shows that the number of hungry people, majority of them are located in Africa and uh, in parts of Asia. And of course, there's this uh, element of uh, creating job opportunities, especially for young people. One thing I want to point out is that Africa is the youngest uh, continent, especially in terms of youth population. So the uh, multinational corporations are using this uh, feature to push for agribusinesses, which of course uses intensified chemical use, and of course it's affecting uh, the soil. And uh, another thing is that there's a rise in uncommunicable diseases, for example, pressure, obesity, cancers are on the rise, and this is being uh, can be linked to the type of food that uh, we are consuming. If you look at uh, our great grandparents, they never heard of diseases like cancer, but right now even a child is born with cancer. So the question is, where did this kid get this from? Most probably it's from uh, what the mother is consuming. And if you look at um, seed uh, within the African continent, uh, there are a lot of disappearance of uh, indigenous seeds. And this is attributed to agrochemical companies pushing their seeds and uh, criminalizing uh, age old traditions of sharing and exchange of seeds. And that is why you find that many of our legislations have punitive clauses, uh, you know, like if you, as a farmer, you are found with uh, dealing with uncertified seeds, for example, selling, they are very uh, hefty fines that you have to pay and find that some of the farmers do not even own the land that they are tilling, they're actually, you know, leasing out uh, the land. So you find that those are some of the challenges. And of course, you're also having problems of pests and diseases that are coming up. For instance, fall armyworm, I know you all heard of uh, desert locusts that happened in Eastern and Southern Africa, uh, where food crops really uh, were affected. And of course, you're having um, the ravaging impacts of climate change, and you're seeing people are dying. Even, uh, for example, in Kenya, uh, 3 million people are facing food insecurity. And you are in, uh, in addition to that, you are in the midst of an election. Uh, next slide, please. And then, of course, uh, there's a push for techno fixes. Uh, so they are saying that if your problem is food, uh, uh, we are going to push for biotechnology. And we are having like the push for biotech cassava in the country. They started with uh, biotech uh, cotton, which is called BT cotton. And now they are telling us that that is going to be reviving the cotton industry. Uh, and uh, this is also going to open floodgates for so many, many products. And of course we had, as a country, we had a, a ban on importation of GM, uh, genetically modified uh, products. But with the, with the GM trials that are happening in the country, this is actually going to open the country to uh, become a dumping ground, especially for GM products. And then of course, uh, this is also linked to trade where you're finding we having the Africa, uh, continental free trade agreement. And of course, there are so many players that are coming, not only from the African continent, but even from outside and putting a lot of pressure for uh, African countries to open their markets, you know, to have preferential uh, treatment and uh, trade agreements. And of course, there are also bilateral agreements, for example, between two countries. And then what is happening, you're finding that uh, this is leading to, of course, land grabs. And we know that for, uh, for us to produce food, we need to have land. We've had incidences, for example, where people are evicted at gunpoint. It's happened in a place called uh, Kiriadondo in, in Uganda. And then you're also having the problem of uh, squatter dome and all this is linked to uh, extreme climate events. And uh, we've had, for example, in Kenya, a cross-border conflict where uh, the Maasai community, uh, which is a pastoralist community, due to climate change, crossed into Tanzania. And sadly, their cattle got confiscated and they had to pay 
and uh, the late president said that uh, Tanzania is not breeding, you know, is not grazing grounds for cattle that come from Kenya. So when you talk about climate change is the lived reality of ordinary people, is the lived reality, for example, of frontline communities, indigenous people, uh, fisher folk, marine ecosystem communities, and, and, and women, especially who are the majority of food producers. Next slide, please. And then uh, uh, if you look at uh, the policy, uh, policy uh, framework, one, our policies are always in, su in support of uh, industrial agriculture. You see like, for example, our uh, climate legislations say that part of mitigation is uh, going to be climate smart agriculture, which in essence, uh, as um, has just been explained, is actually intensified chemical use and this affects the soil. And of course, uh, there is um, more land that uh, more land that is being taken over, for example, by multinational corporations, and this is also uh, causing a lot of uh, conflict because when people lose their land, they, they end up uh, going to you know squat in other places and they're losing their identity because if you don't in the African context, if you don't have land, it's like you you know you are. Uh, disconnected because for us land is uh, cultural. It's also a way of uh, our naming system. Is some of it is linked to the type of land that we have available, and uh, the push for uh, one thing I want to say is that the push for biotech is not only happening in Kenya, but this is something that is happening across the African continent. For example, in Nigeria, there's a push for uh, GM cowpeas. Uh, one thing I want to point out is that for Nigerians. Cowpeas is uh, is an indigenous crop, and so it and Nigeria is the uh, Africa's most populous uh, country. So what happens is that if this becomes GM, it's actually creating a conducive uh, market for the multinational corporations to have a ready market where to sell their their products and of course to also sell their chemicals because they know that uh, the the population is uh, does uh, agriculture. So of course that is a ready market backed by the state, especially in terms of uh, legislations that are punitive in nature, in terms of um, uh, indigenous practices, for example, uh, exchanging seeds and sharing seeds amongst communities. And next slide, please. And uh, of course, linked to the uh, injustices that are happening, uh, there is uh, in the midst of rising uh, global hunger, uh, we also have. Uh, rising cases of obesity because uh, people are not looking at, uh, people are eating junk food and of course that is having uh, negative implications on their health. And some of the interventions, for instance, that uh, we are coming up with as, as an organization is organizing agroecology dialogues at the community. We call them Tafakari forums. Tafakari is a Kiswahili word for reflection. Uh, one thing I want to point out is that in Africa, agriculture is elderly. It's old, uh, um, older people, 60, 70 to 80 years who are mostly doing agriculture. So you find that young people, uh, many do not want to get involved in agriculture despite the fact that the majority of those who consume food. So within these dialogues, we look at uh, technical and political education of the entire food production process, soil from soil to seeds to care for crops, we hold debates, for example, on uh, what is causing our soil infertility. We do practical, uh, practical skills uh, transfer, for example, soil testing where uh, farmers come together and we look at, we do an assessment, for example, how many earthworms can they be able to see uh, from a glass of soil? Each farmer comes with a glass of soil from their farm and the training is done in a farmer's uh, homestead. Uh, and, uh, in the farmer's homestead, every farmer comes with a glass of soil and we pour the soil on a piece of white paper and we do an observation. Like for example, how many earthworms can you be able to see? How many uh, green matter? How many leaves can you be able to spot on that glass of soil? Because the presence of living organism on the soil actually signifies that uh, that soil has life. But soil that is uh, where the chemicals are being overused, uh, you find that even the earthworms cannot survive in such a toxic environment. And so this is where we have conversations around composting and how to make practically make compost with the farmers. And then we align um, our trainings to the farming calendar. 
for example, when the farmers are tilling the land, that is where we have uh, conversations around soil. When they are planting, that's where we have conversations around seed and we, have, we talk about uh, uh, genetically modified organism, we talk about terminator gene because farmers will always tell you that uh, when they grow crops, it reaches a point where this crop does not germinate or they are specifically told by the agrovet that uh, when you buy these seeds, don't go and reuse them. So what happens is that farmers uh, tend to get uh, enslaved. Uh, the agrovet become the stores where the farmers can get seeds and also, and for each seed that you buy, you must buy the agrochemicals. So what we do is uh, creating alternative through, alternatives through community education and practical education. And we are also uh, uh, organizing sessions where farmers exchange seeds with each other and they, uh, they create uh, seed banks within their home states. And this helps to reduce the footprints of uh, the farmer to the agrovet. And in actual sense, it also reduces the market share of the giant agro and chemical companies like Sigenta, Monsanto and the rest. And uh, farmers are also assured of healthy food because they can actually trace uh, what inputs they've, been, uh, they've put on their soil. And of course, with agroecology, it also addresses gender equality, inequality, because it gives space for uh, both men and women to participate. Uh, and we also have dialogues, for example, around land ownership, because you cannot produce women in, in within the African uh, society. Uh, there is a lot of patriarchy where women do not, uh, many women do not control land. And you, uh, you find that, uh, women are the bulk of those who uh, produce food. So if you're not able to control land, it becomes uh, problematic. And that's why now in the Tafakari forums, we also have sessions around land ownership and joint titling. Next slide, please. Um, just to, sorry to cut you off, Leonida, but we do need to move on to the questions. So I think there'll be other opportunities okay. in the next question to talk a little bit more about specifically how you integrate agroecology right. in your work. So thank you for the wonderful okay. intro. Um, okay. So the first question that we had, kind of building on that discussion, was about how both of you use agroecology in your work and how agroecology helps build a climate resilient future, both for the people that you work with in the specific cases that you work on, and then kind of more generally and more globally. So okay, uh, thank you for the question. As I pointed earlier out earlier is that our soil is losing uh, fertility and part of it is because of uh, the overuse of chemicals. So with agroecology, when we are having, uh, first of all, we, we have uh, general conversations around agroecology, defining what is agroecology. It's a movement, it's a science, and it's also a practice. And then when we are having uh, uh, the sessions around soil, that's when we talk about the importance of healthy soil and uh, biodiversity, because if your soil is not healthy, it means that even the food or the crops that you're growing are not healthy. And when farmers uh, do composting on their soil, they're actually bringing back life. For example, you find that uh, crops that are uh, farmers who have uh, compost on their farms, they tend to have more earthworms, uh, bees come back, the butterflies come back, and you all know that uh, butterflies and bees are responsible for uh, pollination. And of course, farmers will also share that uh, their soil texture is becoming softer. So this means that uh, they tend to spend less time, you know, tilling the land because the soil is soft. So with uh, uh, agroecological practices, for example, we look at, uh, we, we train farmers to understand their soil and understand the capacity of their land, as opposed to conventional agriculture, which is about uh, use as much input as possible and, and get as much profit as possible. With agroecology is about what is the relationship between the farmer and the soil, the farmer and the terrain. For example, understanding which crops can thrive on your land, understanding which type of trees can you grow, for example. Uh, understanding how, for instance, if you're doing intercropping, which are nitrogen fixing crops and how do you, you know, partition your land such that uh, in the first uh, instance, you, you grow crops that uh, are not of the same species. And uh, in, in terms of uh, ensuring that nutrients are not depleted. And then of course, we also have conversations around uh, biological uh, pest control. 
For example, if uh, we train farmers on how to use uh, make bio fertilizer from the the neem tree, yeah, and then the, and then also uh, which crops to plant that can actually serve the purpose of repellent, like they have a pungent smell that can actually repel the 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 pest from their crops, and also we we train uh, farmers, for example, on how to make uh, ash brew. So instead of having to spray your your land with uh, chemical fertilizer, which contributes to the climate change, you actually use uh, biologically uh, bio pests on your on your crops, and this this, this does not uh, destroy the the biodiversity. And uh, with with uh, agroecology, you also have um, co-creation of knowledge and sharing of knowledge. Uh, what I want to point out is that within the African uh, context, you find that uh, indigenous knowledge has been demonized. It's looked at being backward, you know, being somebody who is a archaic, but in actual sense, indigenous knowledge is very beneficial. So what we do is we organize sessions where elderly people uh, get to link up with uh, young people, newly, uh, Farmers who've just started farming recently get to engage and share experiences with farmers who've been doing farming for a longer period of their life. And in this, there is uh, experiential learning. And of course, there's also exchange visits so that you get to know which crop can I, uh, you know, grow on my land that can thrive. And farmers get to exchange with each other. And you're also using, we, are, we also have um, a WhatsApp group, uh, which is for sharing of information. Like for example, if the farmer doesn't uh, have a smartphone, what they can do is that they can uh, get it from their grandchildren and, and use that to uh, share like, uh, or even ask questions. Sometimes they, they send messages asking questions about like, I've seen this on my uh, crops. What, what type of pest is this? And with the WhatsApp group, we have different uh, practitioners and, and from across different spaces. So there's always a lot of sharing. And the bottom line is that the information shared has to be anchored on uh, agroecological principles. And linking directly agroecology with climate change. One is uh, if your soil is healthy, for example, it means that whatever you grow is going to be healthy. If you're able to uh, intercrop, meaning that you're growing different types of crops on the same land, one, you are uh, bringing back uh, lost biodiversity. You are also um, contributing to nutrients on that particular piece of land. And this as opposed to monoculture where you utilize all the same nutrients throughout and you're using chemicals and this uh, ends up uh, evaporating into the air and getting into your water. And this water is still going to be used, for example, in, in irrigation or even uh, domestically uh, as in when you're cooking your food. Another thing, uh, how we anchor agroecology and link it to climate change basically is um, through uh, farming practices and land use systems. For example, uh, training farmers, for instance, on uh, 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 zay pits, for, uh, where for instance, uh, if there's no adequate water, you, you dig uh, holes, you know, big holes, so and you plant inside the holes so that uh, if it's dry, you you know you put more water on this hole that uh, so that it can the soil uh, the soil can continue to produce uh, food for the for the crop despite uh, the changing climate and of course aspects such as uh, mulching and the importance of cover crops, especially in terms of ero soil erosion. Uh, which, um, when when it's prolonged uh, drought, uh, leads to erosion, especially by wind. And what we know is that it's the topsoil that uh, gets to disappear. And of course, it's the topsoil that is the most important soil uh, in terms of food production. Because the more you dig deeper into the the low, uh, land, you're going to get to hard rocks, and, and that is not beneficial for uh, for food production. And of course, within the agroecology, we also encourage exchange and sharing of seeds with an emphasis on indigenous seeds. Indigenous seeds uh, do not have a terminator gene inserted. They have, they are, first of all, they are nutritious and uh, uh, they, they can be reused, uh, you know, year after year, as opposed to those ones that uh, farmers buy from agrovets which have, uh, I can say, an expiry date because they have to adhere to the terminator gene that was inserted on them. And uh, conversations with farmers have proven that uh, 
if you use indigenous seeds, they're actually resilient and farmers will uh, often confirm that uh, when we have the community dialects. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Jennifer, would you care to comment about the role of agroecology in building climate resilience? Yeah, uh, we, uh, in terms of uh, to, climate... To, to Jennifer, sorry, I was directing to Jennifer. Okay, sorry. Yeah, that's okay, that's okay. It's okay. Um, sorry. Just to add a little bit uh, to what was said, um, we use many of those same uh, practices and support and promote many of those same practices uh, with our farming uh, communities. And um, we also work to promote the importance of these practices, however, um, in policy recommendations to see changes that actually take place that can impact the nation as a whole and make changes within the nation as a whole. So where we're looking at um, emphasis on all of the agroecology um, management strategies, farm practices, all of those practices are supported in uh, different USDA uh, programs. And so we work to also provide and share this information with the farming community. Oftentimes they don't even know that cover crops are uh, soil nu nutrients or pollinator habitats or um, micro irrigation or drip irrigation or different other um, um, strategies that are within agroecology farm strategies are, are also promoted and supported um, by different um, programs in particular with um, an agency called NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Service at USDA. Very, very uh, good at supporting these kinds of opportunities and benefits that embrace the work that the farmers are doing and help us to promote healthy food systems and healthy food sovereignty systems for our communities. Um, uh, and again, I, I, um, uh, my, my panel, uh, person, uh, what do you call it, coordinator, uh, co-leader, um, gave such a wonderful um, uh, exhaustive strategy kind of overlay of the benefits of agroecology. Those same benefits and uh, apply also wherever they are used across um, the world. And so um, I agree with everything that she said as far as the, the importance and the benefits those strategies achieve in our food systems and with our communities. Great, thank you so much. So um, we'd like to move to the next question for both of you. So we know that there is a growing movement of small scale and grassroots farmers and activists who are increasingly using agroecology, including both of you and your organizations. Um, and we also know that intergovernmental organizations like the UN Food and Agriculture Organization and the um, Intergovernmental Pan Panel on Climate Change are also calling for agroecology as a response to climate change. Um, but many governments, institutions, and regional bodies are still supporting industrial agriculture and putting a lot of money behind that. So I'm wondering if you could comment on how, in your view, we would target this kind of middle level to get those institutions to actually channel resources in pursuit of agroecology at larger scales. So can we hear first from Jennifer? Oh, I think you're muted, Jennifer. So what I'm seeing on the ground is a slow change in um, interest, uh, alternative interest bodies, such as um, university systems, a slow change in, of, towards the notion of agroecology and the notion of uh, building sustainable food systems through agroecology farm practices. Um, and um, I'm seeing also a slow change in um, policies as well as um, proposal writing grant opportunities that actually support agroecology. Um, support the benefits that we would achieve in using those practices, support alternative market strategies that are alternative markets that are built on um, agroecology farm, farming systems um, and support for those farmers and communities that are using those systems and the community organizations that are about um, 
uh, building and promoting those systems uh, for their communities. Uh, this does not address the primary leaders. But you know, sometimes I feel that some of our energy should, as much energy as we uh, propose to give towards those that are in disagreement with us. And we should give even more of that same energy and funding and application of time and strategies towards building um, agroecology food systems um, uh, throughout the world, throughout our country. That it, 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 our, our energy and our success is determined by our actions also towards building and promoting these systems. And um, uh, it, it could be that the, the choice that an institution takes, the choice that the Gates Foundation takes to run their course going wrong, down a wrong way, that could be their choice. Maybe we could spend time also in developing relationships with equal uh, term billionaires, you know, are uh, with celebrities, are with other agencies in an effort to promote what we believe in, in an effort not to um, have that be our only voice and our only part of our struggle, but the same amount of energy and time and effort and money and funds and thought and care and hope that we put into uh, into actions that actually equip our farmers, that actions that actually build agroecology uh, communities and, and build the movement and support the science, the efforts for science and research uh, that support agroecology, uh, promote policies that can enable change. And it's a slow way of chipping at it, but it is a way of still building the system while we're doing this other thing. You know, not to take away from doing this other thing, but it still is a way to promoting the benefits of, of uh, small farmers in agroecology and the benefit of the uh, a healthy food system grown through agroecology organic farming systems strategies. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, could we turn it over to Leonida? Do you have um, thoughts about um, this question of how we could focus on kind of policy change at national and regional scales in support of agroecology? Uh, yes, I have a few examples and uh, uh, perhaps you can also be showing the specific slides that talk about local engagement, then regional, then global. Uh, so basically uh, this is uh, uh, from the work on the ground that I'm doing uh, and through also collaborating with uh, members of the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa, uh, who are Kenyan based. Um, what we do, uh, first of all, at uh, our work interventions come in three levels at the local level, at uh, the national level, uh, regional level through the Alliance, and also global when uh, AFSA and civil society mechanism, civil society and indigenous peoples mechanism creates uh, spaces for us to, to engage. At the local level, one is um, uh, mobilizing farmers to resist, for example, uh, the use of uh, chemicals. Uh, and um, this is done through uh, conducting trainings and then they end up becoming uh, champions of agroecology. Like the first photo that you can see there, that's a farmer in Machakos. Uh, Machakos is in Eastern part of Kenya. It's a semi-arid, uh, region. This is a farmer that we've worked with who initially used to use chemicals, but now is um, a champion. He's transitioned and is actually a champion and uh, he gets called to meetings and uh, we call them barazas, which is a public forum. And he speaks to other uh, farmers and government officials about the importance of agroecology. And he tells them that he's a living example that uh, agroecology works. So that is actually one, one thing that uh, can work in terms of evidence-based advocacy on agroecology. And the next photo is uh, working with students. Uh, when I was talking about soil testing, those are students from a university in, in Nairobi called Tangaza University. Uh, it was a session of taking them through what agroecology is, the principles of agroecology, linking agroecology to addressing the climate crisis and also uh, 
uh, addressing biodiversity loss, of which is a real uh, a real challenge. Uh, next slide, please. And then you also involve uh, uh, women, because within our context, women as uh, form the bulk of food producers, but also the ones working in the agriculture sector. With the uh, Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa, we are engaged in a 14 country uh, advocacy uh, initiative, which aims at putting agroecology as part of the national adaptation plans for 14 African countries. So basically is um, identifying opportunities within the legislations and uh, within the ad national adaptation plans so that agroecology can be part of uh, how to address climate crisis. And the photos that you're seeing, uh, those are trainings that we organized uh, in counties in Kenya. We have a devolved system and agriculture is also devolved. For example, in Machakos, which is semi-arid region, Kiambu, Nairobi, and we, within Nairobi we also brought on board uh, government representatives from the Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Environment, uh, just to uh, take them through uh, what agroecology is and why we are pushing for, for agroecology to be part of uh, the national adaptation plans. Because at the county level, we have uh, county adaptation plans, and this is, and this is uh, cascading what is at the, at the national level. And we also organize uh, food uh, justice dialogues within communities. Like the photo that you're seeing there is with women in an informal settlement uh, called Madare because of rising cost of food, uh, uh, people ought to have be able to produce their own food. And within uh, urban informal settlement, uh, Nairobi, for example, is coming, becoming a, a concrete jungle. There is no space. So we are training people to use um, garden in a sack, you know, you just have a sack and, and put holes on it and then be able to grow your vegetables. So you're actually cutting costs of uh, having to buy food, but also you'll be producing your own food, uh, which is a step towards uh, food sovereignty. Next slide, please. And uh, we also uh, organizing like, for example, with university students across different universities in, in East Africa region, uh, what you're seeing there is a collective of students from Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, schooling them into agroecology because majority of them uh, come from families that do farming. And of course, you're also this is also part of uh, trying to address the dominant narrative of uh, uh, that agroecology is backward and conventional farming, especially within the academia, is what works and what should be funded. So we're actually uh, schooling the students that uh, this is the way to go and you should be conscious about the food uh, that you eat. We also organize, uh, we also organize uh, agroecology forums. For example, the last photo is, was during the 16 days of action on agroecology, basically discussing agroecology with different uh, constituents, for example, women, uh, young people and children. Because if, if children start understanding that they need to be eating healthy food, then they'll grow up knowing that it's important to you know, grow food uh, ecologically. Next slide, please. At the, at the national level, uh, the other thing, uh, uh, the slide just is, uh, the, this slide is showing the various principles of agroecology and why it's important to uh, practice agroecology. We also link the principles of agroecology with the realities. For example, when you talk about the rising cases of hunger, the rising drought, you know, the food shortages, and uh, of course, the emergence of pathogens, for example, uh, COVID-19, which is in essence uh, linked to the destruction of biodiversity and pathogens ending up in, uh, you know, shifting from their, uh, supposed host to new hosts. And that's how now uh, this, such diseases that are ravaging the world end up with uh, human beings as the hosts. Uh, next slide, please. So at the regional level, for instance, uh, still at the national level, what we engaged with other networks, uh, one of them is the Right to Food Coalition, is coming up with the Food Manifesto 
basically looking at uh, what are the aspirations, for instance, of Kenyans in relation to realization of the right to food. Yes, our constitution talks about in Article 43, talks about the right to food and right to sanitation and the highest standards of living. But then uh, the same, same constitution, which is the highest, uh, you know, uh, law of the land, you find that policies are contradictory. For example, we have a climate smart agriculture policy, which pushes for intensified chemical use. We have contradictory elements within our uh, policy framework, which is quite problematic. And of course, uh, as you can see on the photo, uh, we just had our general elections uh, on Tuesday. You see that uh, ballot, you know, uh, vo votes can go to all the remote places, uh, but you find that people are hungry while politicians continue with their campaign. You know, they don't care about uh, the situation of people, and that's why now we're having. Uh, prior to the uh, to the elections, we are having a campaign known as food on the ballot. You know, looking at food from a political angle about who gets what, when, and how, and how our resources are located. Because hungry people cannot vote. How do you go and queue when you, you, know, you don't have food? So beginning to start uh, to make Kenyans start to question uh, so many issues around food and around how this food is produced. Uh, next slide, please. And then at, at uh, the regional uh, level, uh, we organize uh, dialogues on food, uh, justice, and climate change. And sometimes we bring on board uh, practitioners, activists from different parts of the world, for example, uh, in Latin America, uh, in Asia, just to come together and share experiences. And of course, also uh, solidarity, or forge solidarity with each, with each other and also find what is it that we can learn from one another? And we've had this, for example, in with people from, uh, with Palestinians uh, who are refugees in Jordan, who are refugees in Tunisia, looking at food, for example, in the context of occupation and food in the context of, um, of conflict. And uh, this is all, the other thing that we do is also looking at uh, the North-South divide, you know, creating spaces where we can share experiences in the global South and uh, the experiences in the global north and see what we can do with each other because there's also this uh, huge divide and of course a disconnect and lack of information between these uh, two divides across across the globe. For example, uh, uh, sharing experiences of agroecology, how we do agroecology practically uh, within Africa and, and, and seeing how for example, it's being done in Europe or in the, in, in the United States and seeing well, what is it that we can do together, for example, in terms of loaning. Uh, uh, another example is, for instance, we utilize International Human Rights Day days to speak out against uh, injustices with regards to food, but also to bring out why agroecology and seed sovereignty is important. Because as you all know, the International Seed Day is also the same they as the international uh, intell international uh, intellectual property rights day so what we did we we've always done is having uh, online dialogues and twitter campaigns around this and this has resulted into for instance uh, for my case being invited by colonel science to come and and speak out uh, why is it that uh, we are supporting agroecology and who should make decisions about what farmers uh, should grow and of course, it's the farmers themselves and not uh, multinational corporations which should be making uh, this decision. And then, of course, you also may, uh, utilize the International Day of Peasants, uh, bringing out the on the ground experiences of farming communities, uh, of the women, of children who are affected by food injustices, and just to make the world know that this is what is happening in our part of the globe. Next slide, please. And when we are doing our, our dialogues, what we normally do is we also tag, uh, if it's on Twitter, we tag uh, uh, ministries of agriculture, we tag the African Union, we tag different organizations that are responsible uh, or that participate in decision-making uh, in terms of aspects of food and climate. For example, uh, uh, the FAO, we tag them, for instance, in these conversations. Uh, next slide, please. 
And then uh, another thing within the East African community, we have something called uh, Zinduka, Zinduka Festival. Zinduka means to reawaken in Kiswahili. And basically uh, what it is a people to people uh, integration. So we, we come together and have different uh, work around different themes and we hold uh, self-organized activities, self-organized dialogues. And uh, after every dialogue, we normally put across a declaration. And some of the themes that we've had in the past, for example, are movement building, food sovereignty. So we are able to bring, for instance, farmers from different countries in one space within a, a similar regional economic uh, grouping to speak out and, and challenge the recs as far as uh, food production and, and food sovereignty and climate change issues are concerned. And at the, at the global level uh, and also regional, uh, we participated in the Climate Action Week uh, within Kenya, uh, linking and joining our voices with other people across the globe. And uh, through the Alliance of Food Sovereignty, I was uh, lucky to go to New York during the Climate Action Week. And what you can see on the photo is uh, sitting alongside Da Silva uh, and just bringing out the realities of agroecology and why agroecology works specifically for, for the African continent and also participating in the Africa Climate Week, basically bringing uh, the on the ground um, situation, situation to the African Union because most of it is organized uh, by different uh, member states. And um, another thing is the uh, in engagement in the negotiations. I bring, uh, I, I've been lucky to have been participating in the uh, gender, women and girls negotiations within the Committee on World Food uh, Security. Uh, I've been participating virtually, but uh, this year in July, I went to Rome and I was able to bring the African realities uh, the lived realities when you talk about uh, food insecurity, when you talk about hunger, when you talk about land grabs and evictions and conflicts to a space where decisions are being made about uh, food and, 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 and issues around trade. And this is also part of how uh, we engage in these spaces in trying to talk to policymakers, uh, because in that negotiations, I was part of the civil society mechanism and indigenous peoples mechanism. And uh, the, most of the negotiators were either business or, or businesses, uh, the business sector and states. And I was able also to talk to the uh, ambassadors from the African continent who were present just to share with them the sentiments of, uh, you know, like uh, when they are negotiating, they should not forget the realities that uh, are happening in the continent. And uh, in addition to that, there was also an Africa-Europe uh, week, uh, AU-EU week uh, that happened uh, in 2020, 2022. And basically it was um, looking at what are the issues, for example, in, in the continent. And of course, Europe was looking at uh, opportunities, of course, for business and markets for their products. So uh, the... Eastern Africa Small Scale Farmers Association organized a session and uh, I partic of which I participated in and the focus was on where is the funding for agroecology. So it was actually uh, bringing to the fore uh, the question of funding when you talk about a fu uh, food production system that is in tandem with uh, the environment. So in a nutshell, uh, those are some of the uh, regional, local and national engagements that uh, we've been using within the African continent, but also through the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa, we've engaged uh, the African Union, especially in, in terms of harmonization of seed laws, because what they want to do is to have one similar law for the entire Africa region, which in essence is being pushed by the multinational corporations to create markets for their products. And uh, uh, we've also had- Sorry to interrupt, Leonid. We do need to move on to the Q and A just to get. Um, we only have like ten minutes of discussion left, and we want to make time for um, audience questions. So, um, thank you so much for sharing that information. Um, 
So I'm just going to, um, we already have some comments that are, or some questions that are coming in through the chat. Um, if folks have other questions, please post them. We're keeping kind of a running list. So the first question um, is, what can we do as individuals in the US to, res to resist corporate control of the world's food systems? Um, for this question, could we um, ask Jennifer to respond first? Okay, thank you. Um, you know, I, I really think that it's very important for us to build the capacity of our agroecology uh, farmers, to build the capacity of them to be successful in um, agroecology farm strategies on their farm. Because through those methods and through these strategies, it will not only impact their local farm well being, but also the well-being of the environment. This is expanded out. Um, the, the environment, their own local environment, the food system, benefit, benefiting um, uh, and growing healthy communities as well. Um, I think that it's important for us to stress um, and emphasize um, agroecology uh, academic programs like the one that we've just created at Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University. Um, at the same time to uh, promote what's, what we call non-formal education, you know, promoting the capacity building and the farm tours and the learning farm tours for uh, farmers to encourage them to change, to change their practices, encourage those farmers that are already agroecology farmers to maintain and, in, and increase um, their, their uh, sustainability where they would like to increase. Um, I think it's also important for us to look at the farmer not only as their agroecology strategy or as an agroecology farmer, but look at also promoting in that sense of well being for agroecology, promoting the health of the farmer, the, um, the, the other needs that um, agroecology farmers have that can make them. Um, even work more successfully um, in their uh, farming tradition. And another um, uh, idea would be to promote and work to promote policies and find um, organizations and uh, representatives that support um, healthy communities, S support the general the general concepts, the healthy communities, support building healthy food systems and building um, uh, healthy food sovereignty systems that promote the well being of the farmer and the farm worker. And through um, those general foundational concepts um, that promote food for all, you know, that is where agroecology can stand strong as um, strategies that work to do all of these things and um, to also build um, research opportunities and promote research opportunities um, that work to support agroecology and the benefits of agroecology in our, um, throughout the country. Um, I think that those would be really important ways that uh, we can work to build the capacity on several different levels and to enable change. Thank you. Great, thank you. And Leonida, um, I'd like to ask you to comment on that as well. So what can we as individuals in the US do to resist corporate capture, not only of kind of global food systems, but specifically of like African um, food systems that many US corporations and philanthropies are behind? Okay, one thing that uh, uh, people in the US could do, one is to demand healthy food because if, if you don't demand healthy food, then it means that the corporations are going to uh, continue producing. It's going to be business as usual. So when you start becoming conscious about the food that you eat, where the food comes from, then uh, the farmers are going to be uh, have a ready. The farmers who are producing food in the right way are going to have a ready market for their uh, products. And of course, uh, they're going to have returns on investment in terms of what they are putting in on, on the land. And the other thing is about uh, policies. Um, 
political engagement, as I said, food is political. So if your policies are supporting industrial agriculture, it means that whatever food or decisions that are made are actually in support of the same, same uh, system of food production, which is a uh, quick fix. So looking at uh, how can we have uh, policies that are in support of agroecology, for example, uh, developing an agroecology strategy for the nation, that will be a, a starting point. And recognizing uh, the, 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 the role played by uh, smallholder food producers, because uh, industrial farming is actually not feeding the world. Uh, from my part of the globe, uh, the people who uh, give us food are actually the smallholder farmers, not industrial agriculture, because for industrial agriculture, whatever is produced, uh, we it's produced for a market that is not ours. We, we never you know the plantations and all that. We never consume that food. And uh, the other thing is um, uh, drawing linkages between consumers and, uh, and producers so that they work together as a movement because you're finding that uh, corporates are becoming more powerful. You've seen all the mergers and with these mergers, they are uh, commanding uh, a lot of power. So uh, uh, building, uh, having strategies where consumers and farmers can come together and leverage on the power that they have in terms of decision making, like saying, we are not going to consume industrial food, we are not going to consume cultured meat. So it means that you're actually going to be able to, you know, render these companies out of business. And then lastly, of course, there's need for North-South dialogues. For example, a space like this one is, is very key in terms of sharing the on-ground experiences, but also looking at what is it that we can do together to continue, uh, for example, putting pressure on our governments, putting pressure on our legislators, because uh, they belong to the unholy alliances and whenever they meet, they're talking about business and they're talking about exploiting uh, the climate, exploiting the natural resources, and they're seeing the, you know, the global warming and, and, and the pace at which the world is going right now. I, I just like to add one thing. Is that possible? Yes, of course, go ahead. Oh, okay, a, a, another um, challenge is providing resources, resources for farmers, uh, uh, agroecology farmers um, to help them to uh, build capacity on their farm. Not only that education and training, you know, and technical assistance and farm tours and all that, but actually the resources to help them to, to move and to make that change. That's really, really important in different ways to, to support farmers. Do you know that when, the, when we had, and we're still in the aftermath of COVID now on several different levels, but the communities, the consumers actually recognize the importance of growing food, of receiving food that was grown in healthy environments. We saw farmers, farmers that, um, uh, became uh, essential workers in our communities because not only of the way that they were growing using agroecology farm strategies, but also because the consumers had recognized the importance of healthy eating, okay, and growing and the food needing to be grown in healthy environments. So um, this gives us an opportunity to uh, pursue different kinds of avenues and different kinds of linkages and community uh, development issues that address healthy, growing healthy food um, through agroecology, organic farming system strategies, as well as those benefits to our communities. And, and finding you. resources to help farmers to change. Thank you for that. Um, so we had one related question, um, kind of building on the previous one. So I see that um, Heather commented in the chat about getting in touch, getting involved with Community Alliance for Global Justice. And we were wondering um, if the two of you were to ask our participants today to take one action to support the work that you and your organizations are doing, what would that be? Um, and feel free to also share resources in the chat if you'd like. Um, would one of you like to start? Okay, uh, perhaps I can start. Uh, one thing is that uh, we've documented a lot of uh, community stories uh, in terms of the experiences, for example, like when communities share, like uh, they, they went to an agrovet, they bought uh, 
they bought seeds and the seeds never germinated. And they were told that uh, if the seeds don't germinate, they're given a number to call. And when they call the number, it becomes the mobile subscriber cannot be reached. So those are some of the stories, uh, the realities of uh, corporate capture of agriculture that we, of which we've written articles. Those can be starting points in terms of resources. I already uh, uh, shared uh, via mail, and I think you're going to be getting this after uh, the discussion. Uh, the other thing uh, perhaps could be like uh, uh, exchange visits would really work in terms of uh, experiential learning. For instance, if you have students who are doing research and they're interested, human rights activists, uh, they're interested in cross learning, that can be a good opportunity, especially to give you an alternative worldview. Because sometimes if you're in the global north, you may be having this uh, skewed, you know, uh, outlook about uh, other continents. So those exposures are very, very important. And of course, with that comes uh, co-creation of knowledge. And um, as uh, Dr. Taylor said, of course, the aspect of resources really comes in handy because you find that these multinational corporations, they have a lot of money. They're employing marketers to go deep into the village, to convince farmers. Sometimes they're even taken in buses, you know, to go and they're given seeds and chemical pack in packets. So resources, are, are, there's need for uh, resource allocation in, in support of agroecology work. And this can come in terms of technical support, uh, funding opportunities, crowdsourcing, that can really work to uh, enable farmers to uh, set up seed banks in the villages, set up their, you know, uh, do their pesticide control, which is ecological at the, at the local level, because uh, farmers are actually scientists in their own way because, and the, their farms are the, the laboratories. Thank you. Jennifer? Thank you. Thank you so much. That was great. Um, don't have so much to add other than I do think um, a focus needs to be on uh, limited resource, resource poor, socially disadvantaged farmers in the state. Well, somehow um, this group of farmers has uh, often missed the targeted um, development um, opportunities and trainings and um, has missed the um, resources that we're talking about that will enable them to um, uh, embrace um, or engage agroecology or um, the benefits of those of these strategies in, in their environments and in their food system. So I, I think if we um, can reevaluate how we approach um, different um, farmers in the nation and um, uh, reassess how we provide um, the necessary training to um, build capacity and that we work together and engage and build relationships with uh, um, also the resource poor small farmers. I think that that's how we can enable change, the change to take place in all areas of, uh, of the nation, not only in, in our own neighborhood, so to speak, and in our own communities, but it will be in, with the inclusive idea of also uh, working with uh, resource poor and limited resource farmers. I think that this would be, uh, this is critical to making change on a global basis, critical to making change in, in the United States as well. Wow, thank you so much, both of you. And thank you, Ashley, for moderating the panel. Uh, I know I have learned so much and I'm feeling really energized to uh, go and read and learn more and figure out how to support uh, farmers in my own community. Uh, before we close out, which will happen very soon, I just want to issue a couple of reminders to our audience. Uh, we have a couple of extra action items. Uh, the first, as was mentioned, um, you can become a member of CAGJ and get updates for more events like these and other ways to support the agroecological and food sovereignty movement in the US as well as internationally. But you can also directly support uh, the movement 
happening in Africa by signing our letter to the U.S. Agency for International De Development, which is demanding that they, the letter is demanding that they stop using taxpayer dollars to force industrial and corporate-led agriculture in Africa. And we'll send the link for that in the chat. Uh, another thing that you can do is to educate yourself more on this matter and surrounding matters is check out our Rich Appetite film series. The fourth film is coming out early next week, so be sure to keep an eye out on the link. The film series is co-produced by the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa as well as AgriWatch, and I, I've seen snippets of the fourth film and it looks really exciting, so keep an eye out. And then finally, for those in the Seattle area, please join us for a field trip in action at the Gates Foundation headquarters on August 25th. There is a registration link that will be sent through the chat. The event will start at 4 p.m. We'll meet at the Gates Foundation Center, do a quick tour, and then um, do a flyering event to protest basically the Seattle Times not covering what's happening with the Gates Foundation in Africa. It's gonna be great to see people in community. And it was great to see people here today. I am so thankful for everybody who showed up and so eternally thankful for our speakers who came and gave us some of their time uh, today in the middle of everything else that they're doing. I wish you both the best of luck as you go back into your real life um, non-virtual modes of of living and hope to stay in touch and connect the work that you're doing to all of our audience. And thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everyone. Yeah. Happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you so Bye. much, Lakita and Jennifer. Great to see you. Please <laughs> fill up summer school survey. Yes. I'm putting the <laughs> Wait, where is that link? Here we go. <laughs> yeah, so if you're part of summer school, open the survey before you leave. We'll also send it in a follow-up email. But thank you again for participating. <laughs>